The title for my sermon today is Ready for What's Coming? Now, do you know what's happening in your life? Do you know what's going to happen in your life? Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow? What about this coming week? What about this month? Do you have it all figured out? You know, one of the issues with being a Christian is not knowing. You know, when we look at the Bible, it's replete with people who do not know what was going to happen in their lives. From one day to the next, they, they just didn't know. But all of the forefathers, those people that have gone before us, the ones we read about in our Bibles, they all stepped out on faith. They had to. Now, they didn't know what was in store for them. But they followed God and trusted in him out of faith. You know, Hebrews 11 is one of those chapters that we go back to and we read over and over again. Because it shows us the strength of the faith of these people. And it can give us strength and can give us faith. And when you read the stories of these people in the chapters throughout the Bible, we see that they're just human beings. They're flesh and blood. They're people like you and I. They had their ups. They had their downs. But they continued on. They pushed forward. In Hebrews chapter 11 and beginning in verse 13, and we'll read to verse 16, it says, Hebrews 11 and verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. Meaning, they didn't give up in their lives. No matter what, they kept going. And they died in the faith, believing. Continuing, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on the earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking and longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for him. If this, this vision, this seeing what's out in the future, this faith is what got Christians in the Bible through their lives, then it definitely warrants each of us learning the same approach in our lives, especially at the times that we find ourselves living in now. Now, hopefully all of you had read Mr. Eric Rank's editorial this week entitled Canceled. Because if you look at what's happening in this world at this very moment, it becomes quite clear that we have to be ready in every regard, no matter what the situation may be. You know, when Corona first hit, and then all the subsequent things started happening along the way, I have to say that I used to get quite worked up about the government and what they were doing. It seemed like every time they turned around, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. Everyone is confused, still confused. They don't know how, why. I mean, we had it. But what I'm saying is, is that these things are going to happen with more and more increasing uh, ferocity, if you will. This world is not going to get better. We're going to continue to see the downfall of America. And we can't get sucked into this as Christians. We have to be able to detach ourselves from this world. 
like we read about in Hebrews 11. They had the opportunity to return, but they decided not to. We have the opportunity to, you know, get bogged down with, with what's going on. But that's not what we should be worried about. You know, being upset or angry about what's happening in this world really has no place in our lives. Now, we are told to sigh and cry about the abominations that are happening. But getting physically upset only distracts us from focusing on what God is trying to do in our lives. We are pilgrims. We are seeking that homeland that God is going to bring. Such a powerful statement, if we truly believe it, if we truly put into practice what we believe. So where do we find ourselves at this time? Personally, where do each of us find ourselves on the path that we have started? You know, some of us have been called, been living this way of life, maybe one year, maybe 50 years, maybe more. Maybe there's some who are not even baptized yet and they're being called. That doesn't matter. What matters is that we increase in our calling. I'd like to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll begin verse 1. Second Corinthians chapter six and beginning in verse one. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the, God, uh, the grace of God in vain. For he says, in acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted, accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes and in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, and by the Holy Spirit by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by, dis by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. Today, the day of salvation. Do we know if God is go gonna send Christ back today? Probably not, based on what we see and what we know. But every day draws us closer to God, or it takes us further away. You know, Paul viewed his hardships, the sufferings and the trials, not as terrible things that he had to go through. He purposely looked at them from the standpoint of growth. And he shared that here with the Corinthians as an encouragement to the Corinthians. Turning back to Romans 15 and verse 17. Romans 15 and verse 17. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ, Jesus and things which pertain to God. 
For what I do not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. In mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and around about to Alercurium, I have preached the gospel of Christ. How many of us could say what Paul is saying here? The things that he's done in his life were after he was baptized was fully towards Christ, towards the people to help them to grow. You know, like Paul, all of us have been through some hard times. And I'm sure that there's going to be harder times to come. But like Paul, those things didn't break him. It didn't stop him from continuing to preach the gospel as he needed to. And so we are still here. We are still moving forward and hopefully growing. I'd like you to turn over to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 and beginning in verse 1. We read, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These people were scattered across a wide area. They were pilgrims, though. Continuing, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if you need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And why? That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Faith. These people obviously had faith. Continuing in verse 10. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was in the king when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desired to look into. Continuing verse 13, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. You know, there's this theme that runs throughout the Bible. And it's the theme of continuing to develop. 
your character, continuing to develop your Christianity, even in spite or because of the pain and the struggles that we all face. You know, Peter is asking everyone the same question here. Are you living in a way that is causing growth? Are you living your life with salvation always in the forefront of your mind? Now, I asked in my editorial last week, are you growing? If we're making the efforts and if we're really seeing growth happening in our lives. It takes consistent action attention to detail, and it takes goals and striving towards those goals. But it also takes the want of entering into the kingdom of God and to honor God above all else. If you don't have that in the forefront of your mind, what's going to happen? I think we've all lived parts of our lives where we weren't either in the church or maybe we were, but we had different uh, distractions. And we see in our lives the choices that we've made. And we see the consequences of those choices. We can't choose to ignore the issues and the problems that we each have. We can't choose to ignore the pain and the discomfort that is involved in growth. If we want to make it into the kingdom of God, we have to grow spiritually and become more mature. So how do we get ready in the face of hardships? What are we doing? How can we move forward? As I was writing about this sermon, I had to think about a couple people throughout the Bible, and there's a whole host of people, but these are the people that came to my mind. There was Jacob. He had a lot to lose. He had stolen the birthright from his brother and left. And he was coming back home after many years. And he was going to have to face his brother. And he was pretty scared that his brother Esau would still be mad with him and maybe want to kill him and his family. But he took that chance. He went back. He kept going. And as if that wasn't bad enough, on the night before he was going to meet his brother, Somehow, him and Christ end up wrestling all night long. That's just an incredible story of tenacity, of, of willingness to continue on, to push forward. He kept wrestling with Christ all night until Christ had to say, okay, enough is enough, put his hip out, and the story goes on. Just incredible, though. Elijah. There he was surrounded by, I believe it was, 900 pagan ministers. People who were leading the nation of Israel astray. One lone man in a great sea of people. The incredible strength, the incredible power that he needed to draw from God on that day to accomplish what he did. It says that he let the, the pagan ministers, you know, take the first turn and they danced around and cried and cut themselves and carried on. And then he built a single altar. And he prayed to God and God answered him mightily sent down a stream of fire and looked up the whole thing, gone. And then he went and ran faster than horses. 
I mean, those, those things, you just can't even, if you put yourselves in those shoes, what would you do? It's truly incredible. Elisha, following in Elijah's footsteps, another single individual, one man, yet so confident in God's protection and his ability to protect him. In 2 Kings 16, 15 to 18, we see that an enemy king came and surrounded the city that he was in to take him by force. And Elijah's uh, servant woke up in the morning and was freaking out. What are we going to do? And all Elisha said was, you don't have to worry. And then he prayed that the servant's eyes were opened and all around the city, angels in chariots of fire. I mean, the confidence, the strength of, of mind to deal with that situation like that. And to know without a fact or without a doubt that God is there to protect you. That's what we see there. And then Christ. How many times did Christ get out of sticky situations, traps that people set for him? How many occasions did the Pharisees and the scribes seek to kill him? Because he taught the truth. Because he did miracles. Because he helped and healed people. And yet by God's power and strength and wisdom, Christ did what he needed to do to accomplish his mission here on earth. And he lived a life that was full. Not afraid. Not timid. Not scared to do what was right. It's the point I'm trying to convey here is that we don't have to worry about what is coming up. We don't have to be distressed. As we see the world crumbling and we see end time prophecies unfolding and taking place. And we start to experience possible persecutions, what will be our reactions? It is always, always easy to talk a big game, to be bold, to swagger a little bit. But how many times have we seen people talk big games and then when something actually hits, they crumble and fold? We'll turn to Matthew 10, and verse 16. Matthew 10, and beginning verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about what you will speak, for it will be given to you. In that hour, what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now, brother, will deliver a brother to death and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And then you will be hated for all my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you have not gone through all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, no servant above his master. 
It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Brethren, we know the times ahead, what they're going to be like. And we have to be prepared now. We have to find strength through these coming times. And the only strength we will find is within our trust and our hope in God. We also have to be consistently evaluating our efforts, celebrating the wins that we have, but also really digging in to see where we fail, where we need to change. Second Peter 1 and verse 10 and 11 says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly, overflowing into the everlasting kingdom of God, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Tall orders. Especially when we stop and think that we are just flesh and blood. You know, no one escapes uncertainty, insecurities, doubt, or fear. It's just part of the human experience. Our existence is invariably changing and challenging and unpredictable. You know, it's okay to have those things, fear, doubt. But the thing is, is that we have to overcome those. We have to rise above them. In 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6, King David says, And David was greatly distressed. He was fearful. Things were happening that were out of his control. What could he do? And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Again, if we were in his David's shoes, is that what we would have done? Would we have stopped, prayed, and strengthened ourselves, knowing that God is there for us? Hebrews 12 and verse 12 and 13 says, Therefore, lift up your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. You can be healed. You can change your life. Isaiah 34 and verses uh, 35, excuse me, Isaiah 35 and verse 3 and 4 says, Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. In Luke 22 and verse 32, Christ, near his departure from the disciples, says, But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Job 4 and verses 3 and 4. Behold, you have instructed many. You have strengthened the weak hands. 
It's talking about God. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling, and you have made firm the feeble knees. Being human is okay. Being fearful and afraid is okay. But it's what you do after that is what makes a difference. Do you carry on with your fearfulness, run and hide? Or do you turn to God and let him fight the battles that need to be fought? Hebrews 10 verse 25 kind of puts a good summarization of this. It says, encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. We are among those who find strength. We are among those who find the will to carry on. We are those who encourage each other to push on. Well, I'd like to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, and beginning in verse 1, I'll, be, I'll read this from the Amplified Bible. It says, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last day, people laughing at the truth. Uh, knowing that this first, that scoffers will come in the last day, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the heaven, by which the world then existed, perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Verse 8, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and one thousand years as one day. Look, we have a limited amount of time. It doesn't matter whether we live or die. It matters what we do and how we do it. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner? A person's ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And that's what we look for. As I said earlier, we don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what is going to happen from one second to the next. But we can be assured that Christ's return is close, that it is going to happen, closer than it was yesterday. 
God has his plans and he has his choices. And he is going to send Christ back at the exact moment that he needs to. And that's up to him. Our challenge is to continue until then. Trusting in God, following his lead, praying, overcoming our sins and our shortcomings. All the while, we need to be asking for the strength, the wisdom, the understanding, and the guidance about how to maximize each day. And finally, I would say that we need to make sure that we don't neglect God. We have to make sure that we are making him number one in our lives. The absolute priority. We know that we are told in Matthew to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That scripture speaks so loudly to each of us saying, don't wait till the last minute to change. You know, having to go through the tribulation is something that I don't think that anyone can be ready for. That is going to be the most challenging time that any human being has ever seen or gone through. And there's been a lot of nasty things on this earth so far. But then we have to make sure that we are not a part of those people who are going to have to go through that time. And those people that do have to go through those times are going to have to find the strength of God to get them through. So let me ask you again, are you ready for what's coming?